Hello everybody and welcome to this video. It's the second video in the series on Animal Farm. Everything I go through in this video comes from Mr. Bros Guide to Animal Farm, written by Kerry Lewis, available in paperback on Amazon, ebook at mrbroth.com and Kindle edition on Amazon as well. So today we're going to talk about the title, the form and the fact that this novella is an allegory. So let's jump right in looking at the title. Wanting a fresh start after the revolution, the animals get rid of the name Manor Farm, which reminds them too much of Mr. Jones. Now, in the allegory, Manor Farm represents the Russian Empire and a totalitarian feudal country ruled by Mr. Jones's historical counterpart, Tsar Nicholas II, seen in this picture. The name changes to Animal Farm, and this parallels the historical name change to the Soviet Union, the USSR, under communist rule. Animal Farm represents, then, the idealistic hopes and dreams of the animals, a haven where they are equal and free from totalitarian rule, just as the Soviet Union represented the communist ideology of everyone being equal. The title, Animal Farm, is therefore a metaphor for communism in the Soviet Union. And we're going to go into that a little bit more in a second. And this metaphor can be extended to all human societies in which totalitarian regimes rise to power. At the end of the novella, quite interesting, the pigs change the name of the farm back to Manor Farm. And this symbolises the cyclical nature of tyranny, as the farm has now become the totalitarian regime against which the animals initially rebelled. The animals will continue to be exploited and they'll work until they can work no more. Orwell therefore manipulates the title to encourage the reader to reflect upon the hypocrisies of the communist regime. Let's talk about the form of Animal Farm. It's a novella, a short novel, written in the third person using he, she, it and they. Now why write in the third person? Well it deliberately distances the reader from the events that are taking place. For example, the reader is first alerted to the hypocrisy of the pigs when in chapter 2 we see the quote, it was noticed that the milk had disappeared. So in this quotation, the use of the passive voice creates a neutral tone and emphasises how the animals notice the absence of the milk, yet draw no conclusions as to where it's gone. By presenting the animal's perspective, the reader is encouraged to judge the characters and their actions, forming an independent conclusion as to what is really happening. And through his use of the passive voice, Orwell therefore draws the reader's attention to the way the pigs, and by implication all leaders of communist states, manipulate power for their own selfish ends. Another benefit of telling the story from the perspective of the animals is that it fits communist ideology. It focuses on the workers and their experience of animalism. And this narrative choice heightens the irony at the end of the novella. Even as late as chapter 10, the animals still naively believe that all animals are equal and they still believe they are working for a better life. And this optimism contrasts with the pig's totalitarian rule, heightening the impact of the final scene in the chapter when the animals are totally unable to distinguish the pigs from the humans. Allegory. I mentioned it earlier. What does it mean? Well, the novella, as we talked about in the last video, was written in World War II when the Soviet Union and Britain were allies in the struggle against Hitler. We know that Orwell was anti-communist because of his experiences in Spain, and Orwell therefore aimed to criticise the Soviet Union indirectly. In order to do this, he took the form or genre of a fable, a short story with animal characters and a moral, and expanded it into an allegory. An allegory is a fable or story that is an extended metaphor. It has another meaning beyond the obvious surface meaning. And this is so important for you studying Animal Farm at GCSE level and beyond. It's not just about a group of animals. On the surface, of course, Animal Farm's a story about Napoleon's rise to power on the farm. But in reality, it's a metaphor for Stalin's equally ruthless rise to power in the Soviet Union. There's a clear choice of genre, not least because it enables Orwell to make the complex world of communist politics accessible to the everyday reader. For example, we associate particular animals with well-known character traits. Horses are hard-working, sheep lack intelligence, dogs can be vicious, and Orwell uses these traits as vehicles for his characters and their links to communism. For example, Napoleon is a pig, and pigs connote laziness and greed. 
Perhaps another layer of meaning is that pigs symbolise all greedy, exploitative tyrants in any country. And this makes the story simpler and helps the reader to understand the dangers that communism presents. Orwell also invites us to think about the gullible and apathetic populace who allow these regimes to emerge. His choice of the allegory form therefore encourages the reader to explore a range of meanings. Now I want to finish by talking about fairy stories. The original name of the novella was Animal Farm, a fairy story. So let's explore some elements of a fairy story and how we see them in Animal Farm. Uh, fairy stories are set in the past, where well, we have the past tense in Animal Farm. Uh, fairy stories have fantasy elements, but of course we have talking animals and pigs that can walk on two legs in Animal Farm. Fairy stories traditionally are about good versus evil, and they have characters who represent each. And we have good, old Major and his theory of animalism, who wants to defeat the evil Mr. Jones, uh, Snowball trying to defeat Napoleon, and we have evil, uh, Mr. Jones himself and Napoleon. Now, many fairy tales begin with a functioning, well-ordered setting so that the reader of Animal Farm begins the novella expecting everything at Manor Farm to be secure. And this heightens the shock when we meet Mr Jones, or Sir Nicholas II as he represents, in the first paragraph. We'll talk about that later. Furthermore, fairy tales generally adhere to a particular structure. There's a clearly defined problem which comes to a climax and then the problem is solved and everyone lives happily ever after. The readers of Animal Farm would have expected a similar ending, so when this does not happen, the shock is considerable. Communist rule under Lenin and Stalin promised benefits to the Russian people, benefits that were not delivered. Instead, communism created misery and inequality, and Orwell might be suggesting that Marxism is like a fairy tale. It promises good things but cannot deliver. The reality of the unhappy ending in the novella is in Orwell's view, is proven by events in the real world. The title's reference to a fairy tale is therefore deliberately deceptive. It seduces the reader into expecting a happy ending which does not happen, heightens the impact of his message about the dangers of communism and leaves us with a kind of shocking ending. Interestingly, when Animal Farm was published in America, publishers dropped the fairy tale part of the title because it was obvious the novella was not a traditional story for children and translations of the novella into other languages followed suit and left out the fairy tale wording. But in some editions, publishers added the subtitle a satire or a contemporary satire to make the critical purpose of the novella as obvious as possible. Original fairy tale subtitle notwithstanding, it's clear that the novella is and has always been a work of political satire.